Once upon a time, team members met, had healthy working relationships, sorted out their differences to work towards delivering a project. The way of working was largely based on a waterfall model with well-defined linear processes. The team leaders knew exactly what was happening and had full control over who was to do what within the project teams. The word collaboration had a different meaning in this way of working. And then something strange happened. Then came Agile, when, and with Agile came an unprecedented need to collaborate and communicate. Agile has redefined what teamwork really means. Agile has redefined what collaboration really means. And Agile has redefined what leadership really means. And in light of these changes, I'm here to talk about what has and needs to change in our understanding of this leadership role and how it should operate in Agile teams today. Based on my many years of experience as an Agile coach and working with people in these leadership roles, I can tell you that this is one area, the leadership area, that most people are struggling with most. We as a community are struggling with that the most. So today I'm going to ca cause a little bit of disruption by challenging some of the thinking that has been around for a while. Right. But first, let's start on a happy note. Right. What I'd like you to do is have a good think about what really makes you happy. What gets you motivated in life? Right. And while you're thinking about this, we'll run this as an exercise. After all, it's an agile session. So I'll need two volunteers for this exercise, please. Quickly, come up, two volunteers. That's good. A big round of applause for our volunteers. Right. So I came in from Melbourne, and the, the flight from Melbourne is quite long to get here. And I was getting bored in my flight, and I thought, what I'll do is I'll make a list of things as factors that I think will make the audience in this room happy. Right. So I had a go at guessing the kind of things that make you guys happy. Right. And what I want to do, and here's the list, by the way. What I want to do is validate these with you guys, one by one, and I'll call out each factor that I think will make you guys happy. And for every factor that you agree with, all you have to do is go, yay! Yes? I know this is one of the last sessions but you've had enough to eat, right? Yay! Yeah? Right. So one by one. And what do the volunteers do? You guys have a very important role. For the level of noise that these guys make, you guys decide if these, are guys that, these guys are really happy about the factors that make them happy. Right? And once you have decided that those are the factors, Oh, by the way, when, you don't ha when you're not happy with any of those, you just stay silent for, for the factors, right? For the ones that you decided that there are factors that make these guys happy, what you've got to do is use that blue tag there, stick two of these, and then just put it up on the wall so that we have complete transparency of what we have discussed as a team and then decided as a team as to what things make us happy. Are we all in it? Yep. We want to get started? Yep. Right. So you guys know what to do. I think you need to move up here. Just l let's come up here. Right. So we'll put it up here using those blue tag there. Right. So the first one here is achieving something. Yeah. Just use the blue tag there. And we've got to be agile with these things. Very quickly, we'll have to put it up. Trust in people around us. You want to try that again? Does having trust in people around you make you happy? Yes. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> Being recognized. Yes. Being challenged and stimulated. Yes. Being rewarded. Yes. Being loved and respected. 
Guys, are you here or not? <laughs> He's not even noticing yet. Does this make you happy? Yes. yes. I'll take it as a yes. A big nod. Being punished. There's always one. What do you got? No? Okay. I'll leave it to you to decide here. Right? Making other people happy. Yes. Sharing with others. Giving back. Yes. It's good. Being criticized. <laughs> no? It's up to the judges, right? Not up to me. <laughs> Being around happy people. New Zealand winning their Cricket World Cup on Sunday. <laughs> the reason I've got that is because I'm, I'm from New Zealand. I grew up in New Zealand and I'm, I'm a New Zealand citizen and I've always supported the All Blacks in rugby and um, it's quite amazing that a country of four, four million people have made it to the World Cup in cricket and I think they deserve to win, right? So we'll go for New Zealand on Sunday, right? I'll be at the MCZ, by, by the way. I've got my flight tonight to make it in time for the flight on Sunday, or for the final on Sunday. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Knowing that we have support around us makes us happy. Yes. Having hope. And the last one, always learning. Yes. Right? Okay, this is a good enough list for now. What we will do is we'll... Treat this as an agile backlog or whatever, and we'll, what we'll do is um, what, um, we'll tweak it as we go during the session, right? So that's a good enough list for now as things that make us happy. Are we all happy? Yes. Big round of applause for our volunteers. Didn't they do it? Thanks, guys. Right. Now, let's bring this back to work. If, if you think about what really makes an Agile team happy? More to the point, what makes an Agile team happy? Now think about that. What I would say to that is, all these things here that we've identified as things that make an individual happy are the kind of things that make an Agile team happy. For example, an Agile team is happy when they're achieving something. An Agile team is happy when they're sharing with others and learning from each other. An agile team is happy when they're having hope and trust in people around the team. An agile team is happy when they know that they have the support around them to make progress. An agile team is happy when they're always learning, stimulated and challenged all the time. Right. So each and every item in here that we've said, even though the New Zealand winning thing might not be applicable for everyone, but it is for us today, isn't it? So each and every item that we've said make an individual happy are the same kind of things that make an Agile team happy. Why? Because an Agile team is made up of individuals. And without the individuals, there is no team. Right? So as leaders and managers, we should always remember that we should never ever underestimate the power of individualism within the teams. Right? However, we all know that teams don't just magically become happy, motivated, self-organized, and engaged. A huge amount of effort goes into making them that way. Here are a list of five common motivator tools that are commonly used by project managers and leaders all around the world to motivate their teams. Now, did anyone tell you that before the end of this session you'll lose half a kg? This is my contribution towards that. Can I get everyone to stand up, please? Have a quick look at, a good look at these five common motivator tools. And what I'd like you to do is think about which one of those five would you rank as highest, as the most effective in terms of motivating the teams that you currently come from? Think about the work environments you come from, the teams that you come from. If you were to rank one of these as the number one, which one would you rank as the highest of all in terms of effectiveness for motivating the teams you come from today? So if you believe 
that providing clear goals is the number one motivator, you must sit down now. If you believe that providing interpersonal support is the number one motivator, you may sit down now. If you believe that providing rewards and incentives is the number one motivator, you may sit down now. Wow. <laughs> okay. If you believe that providing support for making progress is the number one motivator, you may sit down now. Hmm. For the people who are still standing, I'm assuming that you're saying that providing recognition for good work is the number one motivator. If that's the case, you may sit down now. Wow, and there are some people still standing. What are... <laughs> you don't have the chairs. That's a no not a nice problem. There is some chairs here. Come to the front. I won't make you dance or sing. <laughs> come, on come on to the front. I don't like people standing and... and, and um, and their chairs around. Yeah, so come on this way. So this is good. We're building a repo now. I'm getting to know you guys. I know how you think and operate now. So I'll get back to the motivators in a minute. Let me show you this first. In a 1968 issue of the Harvard Business Review, Frederick Herzberg published a now classic article called One More Time, How Do You Motivate Employees? And his message back then to us was, back in 1968, before I was born, people are most satisfied and therefore most motivated in their jobs when, as part of their jobs, they get a constant opportunity to experience achievement. So based on Herzberg's lesson or theory, providing support for making progress should be the number one motivator. Yet, most leaders and managers have not taken Herzberg's lesson to heart. In fact, just about three years ago, about 300 project managers and leaders all around the world were asked this exact same question. To rank these five motivator tools in order of effectiveness. And when I'm talking about project managers and leaders, I'm talking about anyone who's in the power of influence who can do something to motivate their teams in their, te uh, in their organizations. People like technical leads, scrum masters, iteration managers, uh, team leaders, those kind of people. And surprisingly, a vast majority of them said that providing recognition for good work is the number one motivator. And we saw similar trends in this room. What was more alarming was of the trend, and in, even in here, in this room, providing support for making progress, less than 5%. Less than 5% people said that that's number one. Right? In fact, people thought that this is dead last of all five. Yes, recognition is important as well. However, without much work achievements, there is little to recognize. Right? And as managers and leaders, we need to make sure that we are focusing on the right things. And the progress principle has clear implications for us as to where our efforts should lie. Should always remember that achievements come before recognition. And then support for making progress will make achievements much easier. I'll tell you a little story. As part of my role at IBM, I'm the Agile Capability Lead for Asia Pacific, and um, I do a lot of work all around the um, region here, and I go to China quite a lot. And every time I go to China, my kids are looking forward to me being back home all the time. It's not because they miss Papa. Yes. It's because of all the goodies that they will get back from China. Right? So after a couple of visits, I started running out of options as to what to bring back from them, from China for them. Right? After a while, the Hello Kitty bags and the novelty chopsticks are not so novel anymore. So I started running out of options as to what to bring back from, the, from China for them. So last time when I was going, I thought, okay, I'll do something agile. I'll ask the product owners as to what they really want. 
And in this case, the product owners, owners are my kids, right? So who's better to tell me what they want? So I, before I left, I thought, instead of agonizing in the markets in China, I'll know what to get before I go. So I asked my four-year-old son, what do you want from China this time? And he gave me clear instructions, clear and explicit three words, remote control helicopter. Right? I thought, that's good. That's going to be easily sorted. I'll sort that out in no time. And then I asked my six-year-old daughter, Amber, Amber, what do you want from China this time? And she goes, um, anything that's fun. And I thought, what do you mean by that? She goes, oh, no, you'll know, Papa. When, when you look at it, it looks like fun. You buy it for me. And I thought, why do girls have to be so complex? <laughs> so anyway, I go to China. And after a week of working, as I do all the time, leave the shopping to last. Right? So I had a two-hour window, hit the markets, and I remember all the acceptance criteria that they gave me. Remote control helicopter, easily sorted in first five minutes. Got it. Now, I'm thinking about the acceptance criteria that my daughter's given me. When you look at it, and it looks like fun, you buy it for Ember. And I'm thinking, what am I going to get? And then I remembered that she is in love with these guys. And just by sheer fluke, accidentally, I spot this toy, a miniature Lego model of one of the minions. And I thought, this looks like fun. I'm sure she'll, she'll like it. So after a bit of haggling and negotiating, I bought the toy and brought it home, gave it to Amber, and she's full of excitement, right? She opens it up immediately, lays all the blocks on the floor, and starts playing with it. And I'm thinking, what a wonderful dad I am. I knew exactly what my daughter needs and wants. And within two minutes, there's a small problem. She doesn't know where to start. And if I can find it, this is the actual toy that I brought back from China. This toy has got 200 pieces in it. That's why it's called a miniature Lego model of one of the minions. And it was quite difficult for Ember to pick up each of the pieces, let alone fit two pieces together. Right. So all her excitement's now anything but. And she's walking away from the toy, and I'm thinking, what do I do? So, so I thought, I'll call her back. Ember, Ember, come back, come back. And she comes back reluctantly. I said, look at the photo. What's your favorite part of the minion? And guess which one was it? Which part was a favorite part of that minion? The eye, right? So I said, you know what? Let's just focus on building the eye a bit first. And I'll help her sieve out all the gray blocks of, of the 200 pieces. So we found all the gray blocks, and I left her to do all the, 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 just the eye bit. And then within five minutes, she got the eye done. And now she's full of excitement again, runs to mommy, mom, mom, look, I got the eye done, I got the eye done, and runs to her brother, look, look, this is the minion's eye, I got the eye done. I said, Ember, Ember, come back, come back. And she comes back. I said, look at the arms. They look yellow and straight. I'm sure you can do that in no time too. And she starts doing the arms. She puts the arms together in a couple of minutes, and then now, part by part, she eventually puts the whole minion together. And it was just those incremental progress, the achievement that she was experiencing that fed her motivation to complete the tasks. Those regular sense of achievement that kept her motivated. Imagine if I had used one of the other motivator techniques. If I had just provided moral support, standing behind her, Ember, you can do it. Ember, you can do it. <laughs> Somehow, I don't think that would have worked. Or if I had said, oh, you know, Ember, once you finish this one this time, next time when I go, I'll get the other pair. So you have two of them. That incentive, I don't think, would have worked either. It was just those small wins, experiencing those small wins on a regular basis that fed that motivation to complete the task. This is my um, favorite quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this one. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. 
This is so applicable for, for all of the industries that we come from today. We are all striving towards continuous delivery. None of us here want to seem to be, become stagnant. And the fundamental way to keep up with the emerging needs of our customers, evolving needs of our customers, is to break up our work into the smallest of the chunks. And as leaders and managers, what we want to do is continuously challenge our teams to make things smaller. If they say it's small, challenge them to make it smaller still. And if there's only one message that you want to take out of this session here today, make it this one. As leaders and managers, create an environment where small wins are celebrated. And notice the difference. In 2011, Amabel and Kramer did a lot of work with 26 project teams all around the world in seven different countries. And after doing a lot of research with those people, about two to 300 people, again, across all of these projects, they also concluded that of all things that can boost motivation and emotions, the single most important is making progress in meaningful work. As part of their research, what they did was asked each team member of these 26 project teams all around the world to fill out one simple survey question before going home at the end of the day for the duration of the projects on a daily basis. And the question was, did you have a good day today or a bad day today, and why? 12,000 diary entries were collated, and here's a summary of the results that they got back. And from this here, you can see that of all people who said that they had a good day on any day, 76% of them indicated that they had a good day because they made a small progress in their day jobs. They had a small incremental win. There was no money involved, no rewards, no incentives, no major revelations, no money changed hands. It was just something that they achieved as part of their daily jobs that made them come back for more the next day. It might just have been fixing a niggling bug that, that made them more motivated to come back for more the next day, made them happy about their jobs. Now, the, the challenge that we have here is how do we create an environment where our employees, our team members are also as motivated, as engaged, and wanting to come back for more the next day. What do we do as team leaders, agile team leaders? With inspiration from the work by, done by um, the power of small wins, what I've done is created a checklist to assist team leaders, agile team leaders especially, to adapt the behaviors and the perspectives that are required to unleash their full potential of their agile teams. And this checklist has got questions and answers, questions around um, things that make people think about their own perspectives, their own behaviors, their own shortcomings. Right? And most importantly, it's to remind people to go back to the basics. What really makes an agile team happy? And this checklist is based around four key elements. The catalyst and the nourishers are the ones that promote progress. And the ones to avoid are inhibitors and toxins. So I'll go through these four elements one by one for the rest of the session. So let's start with the catalyst. As team leaders, we need to make sure that we are comfortable and confident that we know that every team member shares that common goal of the team. Every team member knows how the task that they're currently working on, how it's helping the team achieve that common goal. Every team member should feel safe to, to try out new ideas. And most importantly, every team member should have the courage to challenge others and to be challenged by others. I can tell you that 
one of the most simplest yet practical tools that I've discovered in my time as an Agile coach? The simplest yet practical tools is a Post-it note. That's the best Agile tool that I've found so far. And I'll show you how you can use a Post-it note to convert a setback into a catalyst for progress. Given the scenario, an Agile team is having a stand-up meeting. A project manager is also present, and as the team's giving updates, the project manager's scribbling notes to capture all the important things. No one else in the team has any visibility of what's going into the notepad that the project manager's got. Can you imagine what that does to the dynamics of the team? That lack of visibility is creating a virtual barrier between the project manager and the team. Because this is what the project manager is thinking. Someone's got to capture these important notes. I'm accountable for this project. It might as well be me, so I have to write it. And this is what the team's thinking. The team members are thinking, anything that I say may be used as evidence against me. <laughs> I have the right to remain silent. And they do. The team members are more cautious about the kind of updates they're giving because they never know what will come back to bite them. Now, how do you fix that problem? Replace the notepad with a pack of stickies, post-it notes. And get everyone who's raising an issue to write a sticky for every issue and then put it up on the wall just like that so that it's highly visible and the information's radiating out to the team. That does three things. Firstly, everyone knows whether or not that kept the issue has been captured correctly or not. Secondly, any one of the team members now can challenge that that issue is a real issue or not, because they can see what has been captured. And the most important thing is, instead of that issue being refrigerated in the project manager's notepad, it now is radiated out to the team, encouraging the team to have a collective ownership of the problem. So complete transparency is the key. Lack of transparency means you've got a huge inhibitor. Talking about inhibitors reminds you of another story. I'll tell you a little story. A couple are having a coffee, a husband and a wife having a coffee, and a phone rings. And she answers the phone. Hello. Yeah. Oh, hi, how are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dear. Oh, no. Oh, when did that happen? Oh, shit. Oh, my God. That's really bad. Yeah, no. It's... Did you talk to her? No, I'll talk to her tomorrow. Okay, then. Oh, that's no good. Yeah, okay, then. Bye. And she hangs up. The husband, who's also having this coffee with her, is as curious as you guys are as to what was that all about. Right? And she, he asks her, what was that all about? What happened? To which she goes, oh, nothing, honey. Nothing that should bother us right now, and continues having the coffee. Right. Now I'll translate this to a team scenario, agile team. A customer raises a defect. The product owner approaches the scrum master to talk about the defect, and then after a little bit of discussion, they decide that this defect is not important enough for it to go into the current iteration. It can go to a subsequent iteration for the team to fix later. So the product owner, not more wanting to make this a big deal for the team, logs that in his private lo backlog and keeps it with himself and walks away. Now, one of the developers on the floor overheard some of this conversation, so approaches the Scrum Master to, what was that all about? What did he say? To which the Scrum Master says, oh, it's no big deal. Nothing that should bother you right now. It's something that we'll fix later. So you focus on what's important right now. Isn't that normal? What's happening in both of these scenarios? The coffee scenario and the defect scenario. We are seeing that there is a lot of control over information. In the coffee scenario, 
the husband's thinking, she doesn't trust me with anything. She doesn't even want to share what her best friend told her. I'm never, ever going to come back to have a coffee with her again. And in the defect scenario, this is what the developer's thinking. This scrum master is crap. He doesn't want to share what the product owners just told him. How can he trust us with our code? However, back to the coffee scenario, this is what the wife's thinking. This is our coffee time. I want to enjoy my coffee with my hubby right now. There's nothing more important than enjoying this coffee with my hubby. I'll tell him later as to what happened. Let's enjoy this coffee now. And then, in the defect scenario, what's the Scrum Master thinking? Scrum Master saying, my sole reason for existence in this world is to protect my team so that they don't get distracted by other things. I need to protect them from all distractions and make sure that they're focusing on the current iteration's work, the things that are most important to them right now. I need to protect my team. So in both of these scenarios, we see that there is a perceived lack of trust. And that's what I'm all about. We need to be, as managers and leaders, careful about how we are perceived. Even though we may be trying to help, it's those kind of things that may let us down. So it's important to remember that the, import, uh, the, the agile teams thrive when they're trust-based, not control-based. Let's get back to my post-it note thing, my favorite tool. I've got lots of them in my bag, by the way. I carry them everywhere, all around the world. Each one of us has got an invisible post-it note on our foreheads. Every human being on Earth has got that with the letters MMFI. Can anyone tell me what MMFI means? Involved? Close. Yes, I borrowed that from Mary Kay Ash. Make me feel important. We should never ever forget this when we are dealing with people. All human beings, it's no secret, we want and need to feel important. We want to, be, we want to feel appreciated. We want to be appreciated for whatever we do. And it is no secret that teams, individuals, produce better results when they're working on something that they know is going to be valued and appreciated by someone else. Can I ask here, how many people here work with time-boxed iterations or sprints? Most of you, right? And you guys have um, many rituals in the iterations, like the planning meeting on day one of the iteration, yes, that's one ritual. The daily stand-ups, that's another ritual. And towards the end, you've got the product review, that's another ritual, yeah? So you've got multiple rituals. Let me make a humble request. Add in a purposeful ritual called the appreciation session and it only takes five minutes in your iterations. And the way I do, do it in the teams that I coach is every Friday, I get everyone to stay back for five minutes, regardless of the team size, stay back for five minutes after the daily stand-up on Friday. And get everyone to complete one sentence. I would like to thank X for whatever. Go around the team, and everyone calls out, like, for example, I would like to thank John for refreshing the test databases yesterday so that I now can um, test all the complex financial scenarios. John now knows what he thought was work that was being taken for granted is being valued by someone else, is being appreciated by someone else, is valuable for someone else. So John is now more motivated to do that again in the future. With a team of 10 people, just one sentence round, it's not going to take even five minutes. Better still, go back to my post-it notes. 
get everyone to write one sticky with one sentence. Instead of calling out, just write it, put it on the wall like this. And in your team area, just have an area called appreciation wall. And every Friday, just replace the stickies that were there with the ones that are new, right? So what this does is radiates the information out to the world, not just within your teams, as to what this team is up to. Increases the profile of your projects and who's being appreciated for what, at least within your teams. So all the C-levels, all the project uh, delivery managers, anyone else, executives who are walking past your team, they get attracted to the appreciation wall and they have a look at what you guys are doing and what you guys are appreciating of each other's efforts from within the team at least. And what this increased visibility will do is for the people whose names are not there this week, this Friday, next Friday they will lift their games up so that their names go up there. And then end that with a round of applause. And applause goes a long way. Right. Talking about applauses reminds me of another story. You want another story? Or do you, want, you want another story? Yes? Okay. No one's screaming, so I'll just carry on telling stories. <laughs> two years ago, about two years ago, I was assigned to coach a, um, a team that had been running for a while in Brisbane. And they were working to a fixed scope with a fixed time frame. And there were about 25 people running for about 18 months. And they're a lot of, under a lot of pressure. And I, I, I got in on day one of the floor. They were all co-located in Brisbane. And as any coach will do, wanting to make an impression. So on day one, I'm looking for all the low hanging fruits right? so that I can make an impression saying, oh, you fix that, you fix that, fix that. Did that for the whole day, made a list. And then around 4 o'clock, I went back to my desk. I thought, I'll now check all the emails and things that I've missed out on to catch up. So while I'm checking, checking my emails, I'm just busily sitting up, down. And all the 25 people around me are all heads down, bumps up, doing their work. And then all of a sudden, all 25 people are up on their feet, giving a huge round of applause, and then went back to continue working. And I looked around, seeing what had happened, couldn't see anything unusual, and then just carried on working. And then five to 10 minutes later, it happened again. Everyone around me were up on their feet, giving a huge round of applause, and then they went back to working again. And then I'm thinking, I'm, I'm becoming a bit curious now, I'm thinking it might be something to do with me. <laughs> so I look around, nothing unusual, so I thought, okay, it's weird. Then, just before five, it happens for the third time. <laughs> so now, I couldn't help myself. I asked the lady next to me and said, what was this, these round of applauses for? What's all this? Oh, oh that's just when um, someone leaves the team to go home before five, we give them a round of applause. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay, why? Oh, just so that they realize that they're leaving a team behind to do all the work. Now, anyone who leaves to go home before five is humiliated with a round of applause. Right? And the worst part of this story is that that behavior, that practice, was endorsed by their team leaders. To me, that was a toxin. Imagine how the members of the team were feeling if they had to leave before five for an emergency, if they had a genuine reason. Some might even consider not leaving and staying back just to avoid that humiliation. And you can imagine how productive these guys are who are just staying back till five to avoid that humiliation. So applauses are great when they're used as a nourisher, but not so good as a toxin. We all have some good qualities and some perhaps not so good qualities. After all, we're all humans. Here's a list of 14 common weaknesses that most human beings have. What I'd like you to do is be true to yourself 
this exercise, this session is the last exercise of this session. So let's make the most of it. What I'd like you to do is pick three of these 14 weaknesses that relates most to you, that resonates most with you. Pick three biggest weaknesses that you have from this list. And don't get too depressed. We won't share your weaknesses with anybody else. It's just for your own benefit. Right? So pick three numbers, and when you're ready, just go, yay! I'm waiting. Took a while. Yeah. Excellent. Right? Don't get too depressed. Like I said, it's for your own benefit. The next bit's more fun. Right? I'll tell you about my, my biggest weaknesses. I'm number three, very stubborn. I'm number six, shy, believe it or not. Yeah? I'm 13, indecisive. Right? That's what my wife tells me anyway. <laughs> so we ready to move on? Yeah. Excellent. So now, look at this. Because I'm stubborn, I'm dedicated. Because I'm shy, I'm reflective. Because I'm indecisive, I'm patient. Hidden in each of our strengths is, or hidden in each of our weaknesses is a hidden strength. And the message here is quite simple. Don't try and fix your weaknesses. Instead, embrace your hidden strengths. So, I use this as a team building exercise when forming new Agile teams. And it's not just applicable for Agile teams. When teams are new, no one knows each other's strengths and weaknesses, right? So what you do is have an open discussion with all the people saying, let's talk about our strengths and weaknesses from this list here or from any other list. And you've got a well-oiled Agile machine when every team member knows where to go for, where to go to with a particular strength or weakness. When every member knows who to help with a particular weakness, who to go to for a particular strength, that's when you have a well-oiled agile machine. And as leaders, we need to be careful that when we're putting a team together, we don't want everyone with the same strengths in the same team. You need to have a broad horizon of strengths within the team. But when it comes to values, you've got to have a huge overlap in the people that you've got in the team who need to share the same values. For example, for this exercise to work, what you need is people who genuinely trust each other, who are genuinely transparent and respect each other. Then only you can open up to share your weaknesses and strengths with everybody else. Right? Trust, transparency, and respect. All of these are agile values anyway. So finally, to wrap up, I'd like to point back to this thing here, this checklist that I've created. We all know that there are team leaders and managers amongst us that are still struggling with establishing the habits that are required to move from our teams to become good to great. Awareness is, of course, the first step. However, turning this awareness into routine action takes a lot of discipline. And I've created this checklist to help the team leaders self-assess and look at themselves, their own behaviors, and think of all the elements that they can use or to avoid to help them unleash the full potential of their Agile teams. So you can download this um, checklist today from the IBM.com website using that URL. And I urge each and every one of you to start using this checklist immediately. And if you are not in a team leader or project manager role, Print it out and give it to the team leader or the project manager or the scrum master in your teams. And I can assure you that you will at least start becoming aware of the key elements that need addressing to unleash the full potential of your agile teams. Thank you. Questions and opinions. There's no answers. I only have opinions.
go back one. Yeah. You'll get the slides. <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I have to race all the way to the end now. <laughs> Oops. So no questions? That's surprising. Did I answer everything? <laughs> oh, that one's first. Sorry. Just hold the thought. Yeah. Yes. And get out. But it's not easy that way in a practical world, right? Very good question. I, um, I find that um, what a really matured, agile organization will do is empower people to vote out people. Empower people to vote out teams. I've been in teams where the scrum master was voted out. Right? And that scrum master was the, the biggest blocker. And you know, that was me. I was a scrum master that was voted out. As part of a retrospective, they said, like, what's going well? Oh, good calibration, good communication, all these kind of fluffy things. What's not going so well? Deepesh. What do we need to change? Get rid of him. Yeah. So, and that highlighted to me that I was a micromanager. This was about 10 years ago when I first started doing Agile, is I was micromanaging my team. To, to say, oh, this is Agile, I need to get daily stand-ups and, and updates from you and all that kind of thing. And that sort, sort of um, caused so many issues for the team. And you've got to empower people to highlight that issue. Agile will not fix the problems, it's good at highlighting at least. Right? So I've, I've had ma many team members voted out and they don't just leave the organization, they are stars in other teams in the same organization. So it might just be the team dynamics, and that's what you need to play with. What? This one? The question I have is in the system you said, uh, the two top scrum master, the kind of top scrum master talks about all of us, and uh, what you know, scrum master says that you know, we can talk about that later, yeah. focus on your current work now. Uh, that's pretty much very common. Yes. I see that you know, somebody's talking to somebody else, yeah. the other guy getting curious what they're talking about. Yes. Um, can you completely remove that? Because no. Because yeah, guy's yeah. talking, third guy will be yes. to know. Yeah. And that's, a good, that's a, that's a good, um, good uh, situation where you're presenting where not everyone needs to know everything. However, if they wanted to know about anything, this is the culture that we want to create, is every single aspect of the project is easily visible from any place in the project team or even on SharePoint or Wikipedia or wherever. Um, it should be something that's ex easily accessible, right? So you don't have to spend a lot of time saying, oh yeah, they were talking about this and they talked about this and this is why they were raising it. It should be somewhere where, for example, classic one is risks. Risks for projects. Now I see that there are several organizations that have a client-facing report or an external report for the risks, and there's risk for the internal project team. Right? Now, why do we have to have two sets of risks? It's one project, same team, same stakeholders, everything. The, the, the smell here is someone's not matured enough to be open and transparent about all the risks for the project. Right? So that's when you start hiding things. And it's, it's what you need to fix is not how you deal with how to hide and how to show, is fix that underlying overarching problem of lack of maturity in the transformation to Agile. Right? So once you're highlighting things, these kind of issues will show up. Right? So what will happen? The watermelon projects will disappear. It's either red or green. Not green on the outside, red on the inside. Right? So 
all of that comes with maturity and it comes with time. So if we, we strive towards getting there with increasing visibility, then there's a lot of hurdles that you will come across and it's, it's all going to be uh, something that you'll have to work through one by one. Yeah? Any others? Yeah? Yeah, that's, um, it's almost like a meaning of life question, that one. <laughs> I, um, I think what, one, one of the things that we have started doing um, with most of the clients that I work with is having self um, or long-lived teams. So you don't find people, it's like married couples, right? This, they click or they don't click, right? So you can't force people to trust each other in a team. But once you've got a team that's humming, don't disburn them after a project's finished. Keep them together, keep them intact, so that the next project, they pull. It's a pull system to the team rather than push. So once you've found that magic uh, team, don't disburn them. Bring projects to them. Right? But there's no magic answer to how to force people to trust each other. I wish I knew that. <laughs> yeah? Any others? Sorry, you need to mic. Is there a mic here? It's too noisy. It's, maybe give it a go. Yeah. Good question. I was expecting that. I prepared for that one. <laughs> now, this is the classic answer. You know the Agile Manifesto has got four lines? This over that. This is more important than this. This is more important than this. Yes. So all of the, all of the motivators that were there, five motivators, clear goals, providing uh, support for making progress, rewards and incentives, uh, recognition, and interpersonal support. Of all these five, which is more important? And I said that providing support for making progress was the most important. Now, what I didn't say was the others were not important. Those are important too, but this is more important than the other ones. It's just like the manifesto, right? So the things on the left are more important than the things on the right. We're not saying that things on the right are not important, right? So customer calibration over documentation. Documentation is important as well, right? So same thing here. All of these are important, but start with support for making progress. And then use all the other ones subsequently. Yes, yes. So all of that, goal setting is, is the easier one of the lot. Support for making progress, you'd have to do th throughout the journey, right? We should wrap up because it's opening up now. So um, thanks for your time. I had fun. I hope you guys had too. Yeah.